And, and today it's helping scientists, you know, do, you know, what, what humans do. We explore the universe, try to, try to learn about things. And, uh, and we're very lucky to have uh, Carrie Wagstaff here. Um, she currently has two hats. She's an associate research professor at OSU, um, moved up here from California to our oasis in, in Corvallis. Uh, and uh, she's also a uh, principal researcher at, in ML at uh, machine learning at NASA JPL. So we're really lucky to have somebody with her experience here to help teach our students and do research here. Um, and uh, you know, she's done some really interesting things at NASA. She's been a tactical uplink lead for the Mars Opportunity Rover. So I mean, that's literally helping to plan out the operations of the rover. Um, so you know, that, that would have been a fun, fun job. And she uh, seems to love lifelong learning. She just can't learn enough. So, so she's got a PhD from Cornell University, then an MS in geological science and an MS in library and info science later on. So she just keeps on learning and, and, and she also has a private pi pilot's license. So I don't know how she finds time for this, but um, I'm gonna let her tell us what she's uh, working on with NASA and, and hopefully uh, yeah, everybody enjoys it. We'll, we'll, you, you can put questions in the chat um, and uh, there'll be question, uh, question period at the end as well. So. You know, either ask questions during or or save them to the end. Um, either way is fine. All right, Carrie, the floor is yours. All right, Alan, thanks so much for the introduction, and I'm glad everyone could join us here today. Uh, I do have the chat window up, as Alan was saying, so feel free to type in there. I'll, I'll keep an eye on it while we're going through this material. I really want this to be interactive, and I'm eager to get your impressions of this work. So the focus today is to share with you some uh, examples of how machine learning is helping advance science and specifically in planetary and space science. So uh, we have a lot of tools that enable us to make new scientific discoveries. And I, I love this quote by Edwin Hubble that equipped with our innate five senses, as well as telescopes, microscopes, and spectrometers, and so on, we explore the universe around us and we call that adventure science. And what we're able to do now is to position machine learning methods as another tool that can also help us explore the universe and continue on that adventure of scientific discovery. And what I'll describe today are two examples of where we've been doing this in support of <clears throat> looking for fresh impacts on the surface of Mars, a rare and interesting feature there. And then secondly, looking further out into the universe and what we can discover in galaxy observations. So I'll start with a mystery here on Mars. And on the right, you can see some of my fellow detectives and collaborators investigating this mystery. We see a lot of evidence of, of recent activity on the surface of Mars where meteors have come in through the atmosphere and landed on the surface and blasted out these distinctive marks on the terrain. And we know that these have happened you know, within the last few decades because in many cases we have before and after images of those impacts. So to date, more than a thousand of these have been found on the surface of Mars using orbital images from an imager called CTX, which I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, later, but it stands for the Context Imager on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And if you look at a map of where these have been found here, this is a pretty busy map, but I think you can see that the, the circles are really clustered and round, the areas that appear in purple on the surface of Mars. And the colors you're seeing here are not elevation, but instead they're showing you what's called thermal inertia. And thermal inertia tells you something about what that surface is made of. So areas that are very red have high thermal inertia, and those tend to be solid rock. And areas that are purple have very low thermal inertia, and they tend to just be dust, um, very loosely consolidated particles. And you can think of this like if you're out on a hike and you sit down on a big boulder and watch the sun go down, that rock that's been sitting in the sun for a long time stays nice and warm for quite a while. Whereas if you're out on the beach, the sand heats up really quickly when it's in the sun and it cools down pretty quickly when the sun goes down. Um, just a reflection of the thermal inertia of rocks is really high and they retain heat. 
whereas the thermal inertia of dust actually dissipates that heat pretty quickly. Um, and so we can, by looking at the thermal inertia, which we can measure, we can learn something about where dust is located. And so what this map is telling us is that somehow meteors like to fall on dust. And they don't like to fall on just regular rock, which has no physical meaning at all. And there's no, there was no explanation for why they would be magnetically drawn to the dusty areas and only rarely appear in the more rocky areas. So we're pretty sure that it's not the case that they preferentially fall there, but rather that we haven't seen them, we haven't detected them as well. It's a sampling bias that they are somehow harder to find. So how have we even found them so far? Well, um, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has been in orbit around Mars for um, about a decade and a half, taking these pictures of the surface. And then people look at them and scan through these very, very large images looking for those blast uh, features on the surface to find them. And this imager uh, takes images at six meters per pixel. And now at this point has achieved complete global coverage of the entire planet at that resolution, which is amazing. So it's an excellent data set to look for anything and try to find it all over the planet. In addition, we have the high rise image, imager, which takes these little tiny um, images at extremely high resolution, 0.3 meters per pixel. Uh, so we don't have global coverage with that one, unfortunately, because it can only take these little postage stamp um, uh, images, but it's not designed for mapping or covering the entire planet. It is designed to zoom in where you think something interesting just happened. So we use the CTX broad view to find where something may have landed or occurred, and then we target the high-rise instrument to give us the close-up view as a follow-up. But even so, looking over an entire planet at six meters per pixel with your eye is a very time-consuming process. So what we like is a method to accelerate that process of discovery. Each of these CTX images is really, really big. They are 5,000 pixels wide um, and a variable length up to 27,000 pixels long. So scanning through just one can take hours, actually. Um, so what we did was train a convolutional neural network to automatically classify every patch within one of those images for us. And I'll say, I'm, I'm not planning to go into the details of the, the core machine learning method used here, because I'm more interested in how that enables us to do science, but I'm totally happy to answer questions about those details if you have them. So just briefly, we are using a pre-trained Inception V3 model that was already trained to analyze images and then we adapted it to work with these Mars images by giving it examples we pulled out of known impacts. You can see three examples here. Um, although they all have a dark blotch, you can see that their morphology, their shape is quite variable. And then here are three examples of non-impacts. So we can train the classifier to distinguish between when something's present and when it is not. And these are just randomly sampled from the full data set uh, in locations where we know that nothing has ever been reported. And because this is a rare feature, the chance of there being anything there is extremely low. Then uh, after training the system to recognize and distinguish those two categories, we slide it over the entire CTX image and at each point output the posterior probability that there's something there, that an impact happened. And you're seeing a heat map here where darker red means the, the classifier thinks something is going on. And if you zoom in on this patch, in fact, you do see this black smudge, which turns out to be an impact of interest. Um, I have a question here that I received, uh, I guess, just directly that if anything has ever hit the imagers themselves, unfortunately not. So um, just like on Earth, you know, we have meteor showers and they vary by time of year. Uh, Mars experiences the same kind of phenomenon certain times of year there might be more activity than others. Uh, but a lot of those meteor showers are well known about their, their locations and when they can happen. And to date, we have not had any evidence of one of them landing on our one of our uh, cameras, thankfully. Uh, again, largely because our orbiters take up such a small, small place in the sky and the sky is big from where these are coming. So then after getting this working, we applied the classifier to the complete CTX archive, which consists of over 100,000 images that were collected over this 14 year span. 
and ended up requiring 2 billion classifications to be conducted to fully encompass that archive, which is a lot. So we deployed it on a cluster of about 500 different CPUs to process in parallel all of those images and all of their little patches uh, to completely classify the archive. And that took about a week of processing time on 500 computers. Um, and you may note, those of you who work in machine learning, that I've trained a convolutional neural network classifier, and I'm talking about running it on just a regular CPU instead of a, a GPU. It turns out that this was our best option in terms of the computational um, resources we had. You certainly could deploy this on a cluster of GPUs and it would run faster, but it turned out that a week was a sufficient, uh, that was fine. We could allocate a week to just do this on a CPU. And this is actually good news too, to know that um, we can, we don't require specialized hardware just to, to process this full archive. So after doing that, after classifying 2 billion parts of these images, we sorted them by what the classifier thought was most likely to contain an impact of interest. And we found over a million of those had a probability at least 0.99 of containing a, an impact. So that's a lot going on in there. That's a lot to look at. And sometimes some of those are actually duplicates. So since we're doing a sliding window, the same impact might appear in adjacent windows. And since we have repeat coverage, you might see the same impact at different times. So we grouped those by location and time. So we only have to look at one candidate once instead of looking at every time it was detected. And that review, uh, that reduced the number a little bit there. Um, and the way this works is you do still need to do this manual review. The machine learning is not solving the problem and writing the scientific paper for you, but instead it's telling you, here's where you should look first. Instead of looking at L2 billion, here are the, the top, say 1000 that you might want to check out. And if you find something promising, you can then go and request that high resolution follow-up with a, uh, a site called HiWish. Anyone can use this. This is fantastic. You don't have to be a NASA scientist. You go to this website and you say, I want a picture of this location on Mars at high resolution. And they'll factor that into their planning process and try to acquire that image for you. So one of the very first detections we found was this one. Um, with the CTX image and I'm showing you the before and after. So we look for a place where the classifier says greater than 0.99 probability something happened and then look backward in time until the classifier says there's nothing here at the same location. So we can get um, a constraint on the date of when this happened. Sometime between 2010 and 2012, this new feature appeared. So then I went to the HiWish website and I dropped a pin where uh, that location was, and I said, please take an image of this location. Um, and sure enough, and that was last July. And then a month later, this came back from Mars. So we're zoomed in now. You can see that this scale bar is 500 meters. This larger one's only 50 meters. We are way zoomed in. And suddenly it's revealed that this smudge is actually a cluster of impacts. So just like on Earth, if a meteor is coming in, it might break up in the atmosphere and then uh, impact in multiple places at the same time. So that is detail you just couldn't see with the six meters per pixel, but when we are down at you know, 0.3 meters per pixel, that is revealed. So this was just delightful to uh, get that turnaround and make this new discovery. This was not, although this had been in the data set since 2012, no one noticed it um, until the classifier flagged it for our review. So overall, how does this work? Um, we, we looked, we've now reviewed the first 1,000 candidates and we're able to categorize them in terms of are they new discoveries or not. So in, in Cyan here, about 161 are impacts that were already in our catalog. And that's excellent confirmation that the classifier is finding things it should be finding. So we can, we can demonstrate that those are correct. And 86 of these <clears throat> are genuinely new discoveries. Again, they were in the archive the whole time, and they those images presumably had been looked at by humans since everything had, but they had been overlooked. And so it's adding to our knowledge of these, these phenomena. Um, the largest group here are un, what we call undateable fresh impacts. They, they do show that feature, but our history of observations doesn't go back far enough to see the before image. So we can't constrain that this has happened in the last 14 years. 
And for the purposes of this study, we really just wanted the fresh ones that we could really say, when did they start? So we're excluding those, but a lot of those could genuinely be new discoveries as well. 165 of them are old impacts. So these are these look like impacts, but they don't look, uh, they don't have the big rays coming out, the fresh mark that they've happened within sort of the recent era. And so we're, we're also excluding those from the catalog. Um, the good news is that only about 9%, 89 of these are non-impacts, are things the classifier really shouldn't be finding, like shadows or you know, cliffs that are creating a dark, uh, dark feature that's not actually an impact. So that's a very high reliability rate. And that's something that we can feed back in and use to help um, improve and update the classifier as well. So back to our original mystery, uh, we had this map that's showing this weird spatial clustering of, of the known impacts. How, how does that change now that we have new ones we've discovered? So I'm gonna blink back and forth here. Hopefully that shows up fine for you about where the new ones that the classifier found are shown in this kind of yellowish green highlighting. It was actually really hard to find a color that on this very colorful image would show up. And what we find so far is that it's, it's exhibiting that same spatial pattern. We're really finding more things in these same low thermal inertia dusty areas. Um, but maybe that's not surprising because we're working our way down the list in reverse order of probability. So these are the ones that the classifier is very confident about. They're probably the ones that stand out really most starkly from their dusty background. They're the easiest ones to find. And so they're probably going to be the ones on the dusty terrain as well. As we work our way down that list, it's likely that we might see more spatial diversity. But another factor is that we've trained this classifier on the ones humans had already found, which have that sampling bias. And so in some sense, the classifier has learned whatever bias is present in its training data is likely to be replicated in its, uh, uh, in its performance as well. So we, we probably need to seek out more of these uh, impacts on rocky terrain to ensure that it has enough examples that it can reliably find more of them. I'm seeing a question in the chat, um, which I think actually is what I was just talking about. Yeah, what, what's actually there versus what the classifier was trained on. And those are unfortunately two different things because we only have access to the ones humans have already found, which we know has this uh, distributional bias. Eric's asking about, uh, did the false positive finds exist primarily in the high thermal inertia areas? I don't have a map of that. That's an excellent question. But the, the question you're getting at is actually, um, the key one we're really interested in here is, what is different about what the classifier is doing versus what a human has done? So it's finding ones humans didn't find. Were they all harder to find? Were they smaller? Were they fainter? Why were they missed in the first place? And then the flip question from Eric, well, the ones that it's mistakenly finding, are these ones that humans would also make a mistake on or um, are they, is there some other explanation? So absolutely important that comparison of how a machine and a human, what, what are their sensitivities and what are the places where they make mistakes? So here's another example I love of um, one we found in Noctis Labyrinthus where we got this, uh, has more of the traditional single impact, but big rays coming out. And this also was a new discovery that was in the data set, but had been missed by, by manual review earlier. So um, I think this just summarizes what I was mentioning before, the value of having the before and after that lets us constrain when, when these impacts landed, that even if we can't constrain it to an exacted day, it does help us get a distribution over time helps us understand more about the Martian atmosphere, which is uh, these, these are penetrating through the atmosphere, but some aren't making it all the way through. And impact rates are also used to estimate the age of a surface. So a highly cratered surface is likely to be older, and one that has very few craters is likely to be younger. But you don't really know how to quantify that unless you know how frequently and when those impacts are happening. Uh, Prasad is also noting or asking about is are the impacts more easy to detect in the dusty areas than on the rocky areas? We, we do believe that that is true um, because when you land on dust, you get something often like this because the blast has scoured the dust away and revealed the darker 
rock beneath the dust. So the impact itself is not even visible in CTX. It's, a, it's probably, it may even be sub-pixel here. So what we're seeing is the much larger effect of the impact. If you land on rocks and you don't blast away a dust area, then it might just not be visible because that single, um, the crater itself is so small, it hasn't made as big of a footprint. So the dust is helping us find these, but in a physical sense, we don't want that to dominate our conclusions about when and where they, they land. So that's where we are currently with these impact discoveries on Mars. We are reviewing more of those candidates to get an even larger statistical sense of when and where the machine learning is discovering new features. Um, and as I discussed, what are its strengths and weaknesses? And for the second part, I like to move on and, and, and look outward into the universe and, and talk about what we find in the world of astronomy and cosmology and how machine learning can help with discoveries there. Here I have two more excellent colleagues working with me on this project. And in this setting, we are leveraging data that was collected by a telescope in Chile, looking out at the southern sky and uh, looking very deep and looking for remote objects like galaxies that are, that are very far away. And just within this one patch of the sky, the Dark Energy Survey has accumulated 400 million objects found within there. So a very, very large data set. And the goal is to study aggregate statistics of what we can see of, from these objects, the light coming from them, to help make conclusions about what, uh, what the interstellar medium between us and these remote objects is like, where there could be dark matter, which we can't see, but we can infer from how the light gets distorted as it passes nearby, and ultimately what that means for dark energy in the universe, which drives that whole process. But to be able to do that, if you're a cosmologist and you wanna work with this data, you have to be absolutely sure that the objects that you're collecting your statistics on are truly real objects in the universe. And um, you see a lot of things in the sky that are not remote astrophysical objects. And it's known that this data set contains a lot of I mean, artifacts and things we don't want to include in that analysis. So there are a lot of, of quality filters that are available so you can filter out things that don't fit, but um, it's also known that there's a lot of artifacts still in there. So our goal was to use machine learning to help clean up this data set effectively, find where there are anomalies and things that don't fit, things that should be excluded potentially, and that can help inform the science data processing pipeline. In addition, it could potentially help us discover completely new kinds of objects, things that, that, you know, we don't know everything that exists in the universe at this time. So what can we, what might we discover that, that is a new type of object entirely? In this observational data set, we have every object in the sky described by what we're using four different bands that are referred to as G, R, I, and Z. These range from the optical out into the near infrared and can tell you something about the, the nature and composition of that object. So we're using anomaly detection methods to mine through this enormous data set and tell us where the weird things are that don't fit and potentially should be removed or could be a new discovery. And there is no one fits all best anomaly detection method out there. There, um, but for this project, we wanted to assess which methods can be scalable, that can work with hundreds of millions of, of objects. And secondly, which ones make decisions that are consistent with how a human would, would decide about these objects as well. So I won't go into exactly how these work, but these are three algorithms we were looking at, ranging from the isolation forest that uses a collection of random decision trees to see how quickly you can isolate or split out a given item. And if you can do that quickly, it's considered a potential anomaly. The elliptic envelope, which uses, um, analyzes the covariance matrix to fit basically an ellipse in, in feature space and then look for objects that are very far outside of that ellipse. And the DMUD algorithm, which actually originated from earlier work here at OSU that I was doing with Tom Dietrich and others, um, that looks for not just outliers themselves independently ranked, but tries to find a diverse set of them. So you can get one of each kind of outlier very quickly instead of 10 copies of the same kind of outlier at the top of the list. 
And in this setting, we actually were very, very fortunate. It's, it's, it's traditionally very hard to evaluate anomaly detection methods because there's no standard objective definition of what an anomaly even is. Um, however, while we were working on this in parallel, um, there was a massive human effort devoted to going through this data set and iteratively cleaning out more and more and more of the artifacts and things they didn't want in there. So we actually have human validation for what should have been removed from the first version of the data set. And we can assess how well the algorithms agree with those human decisions. So here we're looking at a subset of only 12 million objects and we ran these various algorithms and uh, we can then see out as they select more and more outliers, how many of those were actually also filtered by a human. So perfect would be this dashed black line. And you can see that the algorithms have varying performance, um, but the best one ended up being the isolation forest here in blue, which had the highest agreement with human decisions. In fact, it um, identified just under 5,000 uh, anomalies within the 12 million, which is a pretty small number, which is great. But there were um, this, this small gap here of additional items it um, identified that were not found by humans. So um, we then took a closer look at those 500 objects that the isolation forest said, these, these look like outliers to me, but humans didn't find them. And we wanted to figure out what was going on there. Now, reviewing 500 items is totally reasonable. That's much easier than 5,000 or of course even 12 million. So that, that's a reasonable effort to do. And the way we investigated that was for each of the anomalies found by the system, we're looking here at a visualization of the G, R, I, and Z bands looking out of the sky, and then a color composite that combines that into one. And we look at both the observations that the telescope actually made, as well as the model of that source that was extracted um, through the normal analysis of that data. That model is what's actually used to extract properties of the source and then inform ultimately your cosmological parameters of the universe. So it's a really important part of the, the process. We also displayed coincident observations of the same sky location using WISE and GALAX observations so that if it's a known source or a persistent one, you would be able to see that context and make a decision about what is this new object? Is it real or not? And it's um, the, the object of interest is always in the very center. You can see this blue dot hopefully here. And for each of the 538 ones, then uh, we tried to assign them to a category. And this is what we found was that about a third of them came from just modeling errors. And I'll show you an example of that on the next slide. About a third from what we would call data corruption. And, and that's how I would categorize this one you can see that the source appears only in the R band. It's totally gone at the other spectral wavelengths. There's no physical reason for that. So most likely it was an object that these, since these images are taken at different times, the object came through the, the scene only during when this one was being taken, the R band here. And so it was only visible then. So it's, it's not a real object effectively. And then, um, just 9% of them were actually normal objects that a human would in fact want to retain. And so um, those would be ones we, we don't want to filter out. And then maybe most interestingly, about 20% of them seem to be genuinely interesting and weird astrophysical objects. I see Ken's question in the chat about what perfect performance would be. I think that was referring to here, but yes, we are referencing this to what humans have defined as, as filtering, as outliers that should be removed and thrown away from the data set. So um, when I said modeling errors, what does that mean? Here are some examples on the screen showing you the actual data and then what the model inferred about the source. So often this is where it, it doesn't separate two sources correctly. So it's merging their light together and it, it hallucinates a source right in the middle that doesn't exist. So that's wrong. This is another kind of ghost um, source. And here we've got three that are probably being lumped together into a single source that's also an error. And so we don't want those to contribute to the catalog. We want those out. And these are cool. We found a bunch of these where they have a very bright color and a linear uh, uh, shape. 
Um, this the, the bright color really indicates that it only manifested in again in one of those four bands. And that's why you're seeing it only in one color. And its linear extent means that almost certainly it was something again passing through the scene, but moving so quickly that it didn't really make a snapshot. It's it's a smeared out line. And we believe these are satellite trails. So we're just picking up evidence of local Earth satellites as we're looking out into the sky. You don't want those either. Um, these are also fun. They appear in two bands. So definitely there's evidence at more than one time that the object was somehow persistent. However, it is spatially shifted. So probably again, it, it's a, a slower moving object. It managed to appear in more than one band but not all four and not at the same location. So we think these are asteroids um, moving more slowly than the satellites in near Earth orbit. On the more scientifically interesting, we have several that look like this, where you again have a brightly colored source in only one color, which means again, only one time was it present. However, it's superimposed on this sort of gray background object, which is a physically plausible uh, gray means it was a, in all four bands, so it was a persistent object. Almost certainly, this is a remote galaxy that at one point in time we happened to catch when a star went supernova. So it, it briefly became extremely bright during that one band's observation, and so it shows up in that corresponding color. But because it's spatially associated with, uh, with a galaxy, we can say that was probably uh, not just something passing through the field, but instead associated with that galaxy and probably a supernova. So those are also pretty cool, but not ones you want to factor into all of your model of galaxies since it's not a galaxy feature. And then finally, we found some mystery galaxies um, like the one shown on the left, this sort of purple looking object in this visualization. Um, this color combination is extremely unlikely to, it's very uncommon within the full data set, let's say. And so it's worth looking a little deeper. The second plot is quite busy, but I will just draw your attention to the, the observed data at different wavelengths are these little tiny purple dots. Remember, we're only getting, we have a couple extra here listed, but we only have four to six observations at different wavelengths that are an aggregate across a band pass. Um, but we can actually match that to the full spectrum of what galaxies look like when you point a spectrometer at them, they get a very fine detailed spectrum across the whole wavelength range. And so our best model spectrum fit to the data is shown in black. And there's a lot of features there that we can't see in this data, but it's the best match given the ones that we do have. But it's still not a good match. Um, right here, you can see a huge divergence between what the model says it should have and then what we actually observed. <clears throat> and there are some other issues. So that means it's a galaxy type that we don't actually have a good model for already. And because of that, we just like the Mars example, we wanted to look more closely. So we used the Palomar Observatory to point a real spectrometer at the source and get a true spectrum out, not just a model one, but this is really what we're, the light we're getting from the source. And sure enough, at that same exact wavelength, we have this big spike in the oxygen three line, and that is not expected from this kind of source. So um, what we're currently thinking is that this is a galaxy with an unusually high star formation rate, um, but low total mass, which is, which is again, unlikely. If you're forming a lot of stars, usually you have a lot of mass to be able to do that. But this, this galaxy is different. So this is where um, we, we again ask what else lies within the full data set. We don't have the time or resources to do this kind of follow-up for all you know, 400 million. If we did, we would just do that. But the machine learning is what's helping us zero in on where are the weird ones that merit that additional effort and time invested. I'm seeing a question in the chat. Is there a secondary AI scrub for the human filtered outlier objects um, in case maybe there's a human error to illuminate the source? We're not currently doing that, but it's an excellent idea because, you know, even as humans, we might make a mistake or there could be an ambiguous object that people would disagree on. Again, these are cases where the, the machine learning ranking can provide a, a second check. It tells us where to look more closely because there was disagreement. 
or because there was some um, some new objects found that or considered an outlier that the humans did not. So I think it encourages us to take a second look where we need to, but maybe not have to do a second look over all 400 million. Great point. So I'll summarize just by saying that um, here, we're looking at using machine learning as a, another tool in our repertoire that can help us make new scientific discoveries. It helps us deal with the incredibly large data sets that are being generated in a variety of scientific disciplines and by focusing our effort and attention where it's most needed. I will note, of course, it, we're not replacing humans here. This is um, a concern or a question people come up with a lot. This cannot be done without human experts. This is not something you just push a button and it, it, it spits out the answer. It simply tells you how to prioritize your time and where it's most likely to pay off. And of course, speaking of humans, I wanted to feature all of the people contributing to this work from these different scientific disciplines and ranging from you know, experts at the top of their field and also a lot of students and interns have contributed to this work as well. So I'll conclude by thanking the JPL RNTD uh, fund for funding this work. And I'm happy to take any additional questions you have. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot, Carrie. That was really interesting. Um, so so there are there is some time for questions if anybody has some in chat or you can just unmute if you prefer. If no one's going to speak up, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, given you have a lot of unlabeled data, did you look at doing uh, unsupervised learning uh, to see if it can classify in different uh, whatever categories it came up with, and then you could kind of look at the categories to see if it had come up with, you know, uh, this is something that can be weeded out, or this is something that it it found something novel and new. Yeah, great question. Um, so. The, the first example I described with the Mars uh, impacts finding, that definitely was treated as a supervised problem where we had examples of yes and no, right? right. Um, but for the, the dark energy survey, we didn't really have examples of yes and no to work with. So that one is proceeding in an unsupervised way. It's trying to build a model based on what's in the data of normality and look for the things that are out on the fringe but it's very data driven. Um, we didn't give it examples up front. We also did look at what, even once you get those outliers out there, there's a lot of them, as you saw, there's thousands or maybe more. So using a clustering method, which is another unsupervised machine learning tool to group them, to minimize, so you don't have to look at each one one by one, but if there's a common pattern, maybe just look at that once. And that's, that's proven to be helpful. Those are as you would say, categories that the, the algorithm is finding within the data set without being told what they should be in advance. And in addition, although I didn't get time to talk about it here, um, we, we would like to leverage automation in explaining what those different categories are to help us interpret them. And so um, Eric Huff has been leading this effort to integrate uh, causal discovery and explanations that associate it, that generate a description of what is causing the strangeness within this group of outliers. And that's also been helpful for understanding and interpreting them. Very cool, thank you. Yeah, great question. Yeah, so uh, I guess I, I had a question about, uh, I guess, how you see the, the process of machine learning uh, and science being integrated in the future as you, as you look ahead five ten years so so right now you're you're kind of a uh, interface between perhaps scientists and the data you being a data scientist a, a machine learning researcher um how, how do you see uh, what, what would be your guess on how this is going to uh play out in the future will the scientists sort of just have really good tools that they already know how to use and, and then what would be the role for somebody like you or, or will, will there be some other um, workflow? Yeah, I think that's a really important question, especially if we're viewing this, viewing machine learning as a, a facilitator for discovery. Um, we don't necessarily want, it doesn't, it shouldn't mean you have to hire a machine learning person to access that tool, just like you may not have to hire um, 
an, a spectrometer designer to use one, right? So I think in some cases, if you're out on the edge of, if you really need new kinds of capabilities that existing tools don't provide, there's something weird about your data or what you're looking for that requires an innovation aspect, those are really good places to integrate the, the expertise from both disciplines. But more and more, people in a variety of science disciplines um, are, are doing this on their own, are picking up these tools and applying it to their own data. They don't, it doesn't require a machine learning person to, to make progress. Um, if you're well educated in the capabilities and the limitations of the machine learning methods. Um, in the world of astronomy, especially, there's just been so much progress within that field, people picking up these methods and just running with them, that it's, it's very impressive. Um, so there are, I think there are cases where you still do need maybe some new machine learning innovations. And those are really fun for those of us who like those challenges. And in other cases, you should have the autonomy and the independence and the ability to apply them to your data and, and move forward. Yeah, so so you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned limitations there, being aware of limitations. So, so how much risk do you see going forward and maybe have already seen of people uh, making mistakes and, and having discoveries that, that are not really discoveries? That's right. I, that's always a danger if, um, if you are at the point where you're applying something but maybe don't fully understand the implications or what. That, that's one reason I like to talk about the sampling bias effect for the Mars um, example, because there's a temptation to say, oh, um, you know, an objective classifier found this. But there, there really is no such thing as an objective classifier because it has to be trained on the subjective judgments that kind of came from some other source, right? And it will reflect those patterns and behaviors. And a lot of us are well aware of this, but if you haven't encountered that before, it can be pretty surprising. Um, and so this leads to um, new thoughts about how you should collect your, your training data, how you should curate it, and maybe what kind of coverage you need to get the results you want. I don't have a specific example, I guess, other than that, like I'm showing you, it's reflecting the spatial bias that we think is non-physical in that particular example. But I think it, that's a pretty compelling one that you have to be careful with your with what you train it on. Right, certainly if it had been somebody other than you or who really understood this, they might've come to yeah, an improper conclusion there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that it's somehow independently reinforcing something, but it's really not. It's it's definitely dependent. It would have been in the New York Times, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So, do we have any other uh, questions? Okay, there it looks like there's a question um, from Thomas. Um, so, so uh, are the Mars impact crater points available in time series GIS data anywhere? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, great point. Um, so the, the existing catalog I referred to of, of over a thousand known fresh impacts on Mars, which was led by Ingrid Daubar, has been, I think an earlier version of that has been published. I don't know if her latest one greater than a thousand is actually published. Um, I can ask her about where that, that currently would be. The ones that the machine learning <clears throat> method is adding to it, we are in the process of publishing that and making that available. Um, I think it's really important, but I think we'd like to get more, get past more than just the first thousand reviewed so that we can offer a, a larger increment to the existing data set. So I wasn't sure if you're asking of which one you're asking about there, but um, but you can, add, you can definitely get the catalog of the um, manually curated and found ones. Uh, elsewhere. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for asking. Okay, so we have another question in chat. Um, so, so what else are you planning to have as checks and balances to remove possible machine bias? Yeah, and I think um, there, there is an aspect of bias that can be built into an algorithm. But the main bias we're seeing here is not even a machine bias. It's truly a I might call it a data bias or even a human bias or a sampling bias, you know? So I, I don't think it's possible to entirely remove that until we fully understand the, the base, the limitations of our own labeling and sampling bias. 
but it certainly could highlight it. And um, the two things we definitely are looking at currently, as you saw maybe in both of those examples, is probing places where the human judgments and the machine judgments disagree. That's really key. And also, uh, this is just a basic thing of science, right? But plotting your results against your expectations, like just looking at that spatial map, it, it raises red flags because we don't expect there to be any reason why there would be spatial clustering of meteorite impacts on the body. And so just those basic sanity checks are really important. And again, that's why you would not want to just push the button and then spit out a table of results that people are going to make conclusions from. Thanks. Um, we'll see if another question comes up, but I, I'm, I'm curious just to uh, hear from you what, so, so given all the excitement of the new rover and you know helicopters on Mars, what, what do you personally find most exciting about uh, Mars exploration coming up in the next year or two? Oh, what a great question. I could probably talk a whole hour on just on that, yeah, but- I figured, but maybe- <laughs> I think, yeah, um, it's always exciting to be landing in a new place on Mars and having that close up view that we've never had before. In, in Jezero Crater, which is where the Perseverance lander the rover has landed, um, the terrain there is really different from what we've seen from the Mars Science Laboratory rover or the Mars Exploration rovers. It's, it's not as simple, perhaps, um, as what we've seen before. There's more heterogeneity and therefore more opportunity for discovering new kinds of terrain or history embedded in the rocks that we find. So that's really exciting. Um, the technology demo for the Ingenuity helicopter, I know a lot of folks are excited about that. The first time we've done powered flight on another planet, the first time we have one asset able to watch and record the, uh, from the outside, the actions of another. Mm -hmm. um, the first time we can do remote surveillance and scout where the rover should go from an up close view. That's just amazing. Um, and, and all of that is of course, paving the way for a future sample return mission. One of the big goals of Perseverance is to collect samples in little sample tubes and cache them so that a future mission can, a future rover can roll up, pick that up and actually send it back to the earth. That's one of our big aspirations. So that's one of the future things I'm watching for. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, so we, we do have another question here. So um, if given more resources to do a project, what would you do? Oh, that's always a good question. <laughs> um, I, I think I indicated that we're very eager to review more than just the first thousand of those amazing candidates found by uh, the Mars data analysis. And we don't have current funding for that work. So at this point, it's kind of do what we can with our on the side. So I would love to do a more exhaustive analysis of that. I'm personally very interested in that deeper question of why were some of these missed by humans? It, was it just fatigue? Are they like randomly missing or is there a pattern? What we've found to date is that the, the ones found by the classifier that were missed are more likely to be cluster impacts like that very first one I showed you. And so they have very irregular shapes. And it could be that, you know, as a human, you're looking for a starburst kind of impact shape and if it's a weird oblong smudge, it's harder for you to recognize. But this is completely um, speculation on my part right now. And we need, we need more examples so we can have a summary of here's what the human is really good at finding. And here's where they were missed, and the, but the computer found it as well. So could that be a re-education process or do we, is it just that they're just hard to find and humans don't have enough time? Um, so I, I think given more resources, I would love, I want to go further on that aspect of that project for sure. Very nice. All right, final, final question, yes or no. Um, so, so if Elon Musk recruited you to go to Mars safely and you're going to get there safely and stay there, well, for the, for the rest of your life, would you go? Um, absolutely, I would. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, it's <laughs> to know. That's a great question. Not, but, <laughs> well, what was that? Uh, I would not. No, but, you would uh, not. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, thanks for the talk today. It's been really interesting. Um, it's been really great to see actual work going on at NASA and, and 
We've got Kiri here at OSU to teach our students. So we're very lucky. Um, everybody, uh, thanks for coming. And we will uh, be back in two weeks with our next talk. Thanks.